Welcome, age of vintage society. I still recall her blue eyes, more like a baby doll on screen, just before we forget the fleshy and intrinsically cheerful Joan Blondell. She was among the trendy sex symbols of the 1930s, appearing in some of the sassiest and most seductive classics. Fans will notably remember those characteristic displays of her attractive assets and dazzling wit. She was ever ready to do what she knows how to best, to act, obey studio instruction, and satisfy the fantasy desires of movie fans. Was Joan Blondell just a girl with big melons in Hollywood? As you all know how much I appreciate you, my viewers, so I want to thank you for your generous comments and for the Patreons. This video would not have been possible without you, and thanks to those who watched the video right to the end. What stories have you heard about the historic sensual movie symbol Joan Blondell? She was no doubt among the sassiest of her kind, good-humoured, and eventually became one of the hottest Warner Brothers stocks in trade at the time. She was, of course, one of the reigning sex panoramas of pre-code Hollywood, and was said to have worked doggedly throughout her lifetime to satisfy her audience, mainly driven by the urge to make more money in an enduring career that did not hold much in terms of professional recognition. Blondell featured in more than 50 films for Warner Brothers within the 10-year-plus era with the studio, and partnered with her best collaborator James Cagney in seven of those films. Many say her effortless charm as an actress comes naturally as an innate talent. Another collaborator with Blondell is harder-boiled Glenda Farrell, who appeared in eight of her movies. From comic movies and gangster dramas to musicals, Blondell was remarkable in her overt display of what she happily referred to as her big boobs. Her enormously striking blue eyes are noticeable in each of Warner's movie varieties that she featured. Critics think that Blondell's carefree nature is a product of what she learned as a child growing up in a vaudeville atmosphere. Perhaps the reason for the ease at which she makes friends and easily fit into systems and situation, including adapting to the ever-changing ambience career-wise. She may also have learned how to be inclined to accrue, master lines and augment the performances of others. More importantly, she learned to smile on cue and to put the act above every other thing. Did she also inculcate discipline, hard work and perseverance? This is one area that she excelled in, whether learned or as part of her natural talent, but many felt she missed some vital lessons still, the need to value herself, her skills and her emotions, which unfortunately denied her so much in terms of love and personal happiness. Young Blondell joined Hollywood almost simultaneously with the fading of silent pictures. With youthful Jimmy Cagney they made their way in as two Broadway newcomers, producing a play that made it to the screen with the title Sinner's Holiday. As convincing as her debut with Cagney is, Cagney's charisma is undeniable, hence the studio, despite identifying the Calibo as a hot asset, gave more credit to Cagney, who was thereafter given a starring position with the payment to match. But it was a different thing for Blondell, who was poorly compensated because her negotiation skill was weaker. This made her to be used regularly to strengthen others' performance or make livelier dropping shows. But her appearances in stretched, rapid-fire pre-code movies are almost unrivalled. Her contribution can only be outnumbered by the likes of Barbara Stanwyck and a few women that truly reach the upper tier in their performances. She was outstanding in some of the most unforgettable films of the era as seen in Blonde Crazy, Night Nurse, Three on a Match and the Busby Barclay musicals Dames and Gold Diggers of 1933. In what was described as a life crammed with contradictions, Blondell was regularly quoted to have referred to herself as a work pony, as such demeaning her successes while trying to get accolades and sometimes roles that she technically deserved. As one who started seeing stage acts as early as 14 months after birth, and became a regular vaudeville performer at the age of three through her parent, Blondell was better prepared for her career, touring the globe at different times of her life, but not pulsing to established pedigree. A lifestyle that she had to struggle to stop because it was deep-rooted in her. She desired to settle and build her own home, but it was as difficult as her career breakthrough to stardom despite her efforts. 
Observers believe that Blondell's career was better each time she finds personal stability. But as soon as she uses the security to strengthen her career, she seeks and takes risks that eventually would undermine her domestic happiness, because the pattern of meandering from coast to coast in search of important roles was never tolerated by the men in her life, as they saw her as a people-pleasing petite blonde. The likes of George Barnes, Dick Powell and Mike Todd, who was ready to shape family life with her at different stages of her life, did not hesitate to separate with her for a more realistic woman with needs for a family. Some of the issues that destroyed her family life are her on-the-move lifestyle, her husband's financial irresponsibility and his emotional and bodily abuse. Hence was said to have only felt marital bliss intermittently. Sadly too, despite her enormous contribution to the entertainment industry, professional stardom was far from being a reality. So technically Blondell's career and family successes were both intermittent and short-lived, rising and falling with their changing outcome. Even though Blondell was nominated for an Academy Award for The Blue Veil, almost everyone knew that her best and most unforgettable performance in the post-Warner years was that outing as Aunt Sissy in Elia Kazan's version of the best-selling novel A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, mainly because it was her favourite role. Though a few of her best productions were killed on the editing room floors due to their adult sensitive nature and the regulations of the production code at the time, an editorial requirement she found very disturbing to her career success. The only reason fans may want to think of those censored films is that she is just one of the few women whose career endured throughout her entire adult life. Blondell was said to have worked almost constantly and, while she was reported ridiculing and reducing her artistic strengths, Blondell trusted her talents to provide for her financially even though it was not coming as she had wanted it, especially in career honour. At some point in her life she ditched dating but not her career, and was said to have worked even while sincerely ill until she turned 73, the year she had leukaemia. Rose Joan Blondell, who was born Rose Joan Bluestein on the 30th of August 1906 in New York, made her presence felt in the entertainment industry between 1927 to 1979. Making over 100 films and television appearances, she proved to her fans that she loved her job more than anything else, as was obvious in her zeal throughout the half a century of career exploit. Levi Bluestein, her father, was of Jewish descent and a remarkable vaudeville comedian, married to her mother, Brooklyn-born Catherine Kane. The couple was said to have introduced Blondell to the family business as an infant, making her earliest stage appearance as soon as possible, after birth, as she was supported in a cradle and identified as the daughter of Peggy Astaire in The Greatest Love. Her journey from place to place started with her parents as the duo hauled her in a cradle as they shuttled cities as part of a vaudeville troupe, the Bouncing Blondells. This constant environmental shifting exposed Blondell to about 12 months in Honolulu and six years in Australia and other cities as a child before her parents settled in Dallas and then Texas for a brief practice of normal family life. Having been revealed to the world through those journeys, it is only natural that she found herself in the performing art. No wonder as a teenager in her early 17 years with an instinct for showbiz, Blondell entered and won the 1926 Miss Dallas pageant and was a finalist in the Miss Universe pageant and Miss America in New Jersey that same year. Based on what she learned as a child growing up, she had always believed that shows are about making money rather than fame. That was why she was so motivated after winning $2,000 prize money that year. She was pleased to assist her parents to offset their bills. It was not clear how she got inspired into modelling, but her beauty perhaps was an attraction that may have led her to it. While schooling at Santa Monica High School, Blondell was said to have actively participated in school plays, including editing the school's annual publication. She also studied at the North Texas State Teachers College in Denton, where her mother was a neighbourhood stage performer. At the time, she christened herself Rosebud Blondell. She was very active as a young lady, providing for herself and her family when the vaudeville popularity and profitability started to diminish. Doing some odd jobs, including working as a librarian, was part of her age-long struggle for survival. 
After winning the pageant, Blondell was said to have escaped brutal assault by a man who felt she betrayed him on issues relating to the contest. Fleeing from the man's car, she had ended up with a broken ankle. Unfortunately, it was also while closing up the library as part of her job schedule that she was said to have been abused by a police officer. All her suffering and triumphs remained a secret until she revealed them in her memoirs several years later. My family needed what I could make. For five of us, I had to make money, even if it's small money, she had said, adding that she was most grateful to be making money for them. Acting, she says, initially was just to help out with her family. It was obvious that Joan Blondell started her career just to assist her family rather than becoming a famous star. It was after her father's vaudeville act crumpled in the late 1920s that she decided to try her luck full-time in the changing entertainment industry. After a wonderful showing in the play Penny Arcade with Cagney, Al Jolson acquired the franchise before selling same to Warner Brothers, but maintained that Cagney and Blondell should run the show. The title was thereafter changed to Sinner's Holiday in 1930. That was the period audience first saw a brown-haired Blondell and was described as a 10th Avenue cruiser. Luckily for her, she was already a skilful eyes roller with an efficiency that made her very likeable, so she naturally could do mean roles in films. Blondell was a regular buzz, and with her honest look, fun and common sense, she worked her way up the Warner Brothers ladder, appearing often in her underwear in William Wellman's Other Men's Women in 1931. Blondell told her fans that she's APO, meaning ain't puttin' out. Her performance as girls on the make, who were in some way decent, made her a classic wise-cracking heroine for the era. She is remarkably outstanding in her style that was described by critics as lacking self-consciousness, as seen in a scene in Three on a Match in 1932. Hooked up in some way in a beauty parlour in extreme close-up, Blondell abandoned her unproductiveness to her audience, as if saying, You are free to take a look, kids. Blondell was neither a nitpicker nor a rebel for a better role like her Warner Brothers co-actors, though she later described it as a period of hard labour and gruesome hours, adding that the worst of it is when you don't even have enough time to go to the bathroom. Even Cagney agreed that Blondell could have done much better things than the roles the studio gave her. Jo Blondell loved family life as much as she loved her job, and was said to have regularly emphasised that her home and family were as vital to her as any acting job, even though her relationship with her spouse was as discomforting as no one would wish for a friend. Blondell married three times to three different men. During her union with George Barnes, he was reported to have forced her into doing several abortions against her will. When she eventually disobeyed him, the outcome was the birth of her first son, Norman Scott. She married actor and director Dick Powell in 1936, the marriage produced her daughter, Ellen Powell. Powell also adopted Norman. At this time, she got to the climax of her career popularity, even though none of her movies so far made a list in movies. Her working conditions remained ridiculous, despite her genuine effort. A report was made of how Blondell was too ill to come to work on I've Got Your Number in 1934. Warner Brothers sent the crew to her house. While on her bed, the scriptwriter was told to invent a sickbed scene in the climax of the film, just so they can use her even while she was unfit. Not even a heartfelt letter to producers pleading for a fresh arrangement that could make her more vibrant would yield any positive response. When Blondell married for the third time to producer Mike Todd, the union was likened to an emotional come financial disaster that was doomed for a divorce in 1950. She was said to have accused Todd of grabbing her outside a hotel window by her ankles. He was not just a heavy spender who misplaced lots of money on gambling. They went through a series of contentious bankruptcies during the marriage. Todd's mistrust and jealousy and his vicious rages were extraordinary, that after a particular fight he had to poison Blondell's dog. He went after her money and even stole her pieces of jewellery, and would later release it to his lover Elizabeth Taylor, who later became his wife. Blondell, after undergoing those traumatic experiences, was said to have given up on men. Quite understandable, but she did not give in to her career quest. 
Regardless of age and several circumstances, Blondell continued her journeying, even under the nervous tension of crippling rheumatoid arthritis. Bizarre as this may seem, she made her final appearance in a John Cassavetes movie, opening night in 1978. Observers thought she looked horrible in the production, being clouded by years of build-up, physical sting, fruitless toil and family complicatedness. Looking very close to death, Blondell was said to have revealed her entertainer's mask in an excusably harsh old lady. Joan Blondell was on the 25th of December 1979 confirmed dead as a result of leukaemia in California, leaving behind a sister and her two children who stood by her bedside. There have always been clever women who knew how to help themselves in a male society. Why, even powerful men feared from Margaret Sullivan. Watch this video.